could deny that. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. Yes. God help us to be faithful to him. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. And good evening, Internet. Let's join in worship tonight. Oh, we're going to start with standing up. <laughs> <laughs> and page 264 I will sing of my Redeemer everyone pick up a book let's sing together let's worship together sing I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me on the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free, sing, oh sing, of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me, on the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free, I will tell the wondrous story. My lost estate to save in his boundless love and mercy, he the ransom freely gave. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me on the cross, he sealed my pardon. I will praise my dear Redeemer, with power I'll tell, how the victory given, over sin and death and hell, sing, oh sing, of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me, on the cross he sealed my pardon. And make me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life that brought me, Son of God, with him I'll be. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer with his blood. Purchase me on the cross. He healed my pardon. He paid the debt and made me free. Amen. Remain standing, please. Thank the Lord. Are you thankful for our Redeemer tonight? Yes. Amen. Isn't it wonderful? So thankful for our, our Heavenly Father this evening and everything that He does for us. Man, what a service this morning. Thank God yes. for Brother Worley. Appreciate the message. I was, there was something I clung to today. I thought, man, that, that one statement he made I thought would just preach all by itself. But what this generation will tolerate, the next yes. generation will embrace. There's a lot, a lot to be said in just that one statement right there. Man, it is so true. So true, but uh, so thankful for that this morning. Uh, we got a few uh, prayer requests, and, and I want to read this uh, card here in just a second. But uh, uh, Brother Jackson has uh, injured his hand, so you guys be, rem be remembering him in prayer. Uh, then also Brother Roger Cummings uh, does have a, a pretty serious infection. They haven't nailed that down exactly what that is just yet, but they are transferring him uh, to Ohio State. So you guys remember him in prayer. I know he'd definitely appreciate that. Also, Sister Donna, Donna Roman has been uh, sick as well, so continue to lift her up. Uh, and I know there's many other needs amongst the congregation. Maybe just by an upraised hand tonight, you'd like to make your needs known. Absolutely, we've been remembering those things in prayer. And also, we had a, a card from the Miller family, I believe. Uh, it says, uh, Brother Tony and congregation, thank you for the flowers that you sent to Dad's funeral. They were uh, very pretty. We also appreciated the visits, the thoughts, and the prayers of the people in the congregation during Dad's illness and after his death. 
Uh, it meant a lot to Dad to us, and the church was a big part of Dad's life. We would also like to thank the people who were prepared to serve. Uh, the dinner after the funeral made, but God bless you all. So that's from the Miller family. Uh, I've asked Brother Roman uh, if he would come and pray tonight, pray especially for our meeting. Brother Worley tonight, and, and God's hand upon him. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you one more time for the great privilege we have, Father, to come into this house of worship. Yes. Lord, we read of people over the world, churches over the world, God, where they have to go by night, or Lord, uh, uh, where they're persecuted for gathering together or having a Bible, Lord, and we thank you this evening that we have the great privilege, God, of being one of your children. Heavenly Father, and having this privilege to gather together here to share burdens one with another, knowing, God, that you're on the throne, Father. Lord, you're still in the healing business, God, and Lord, you're in the saving business, and God, we thank you for your mighty hand. We thank you for the service this morning, Lord, for the souls, God, that were helped. Yes, Lord, we don't always see everything that's accomplished. But, oh, God, we know that when your word goes forth, Lord, it never is turned to void, God, but it brings to pass the things which are needed. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name this evening that you'll bless this people tonight, God. You see the hearts of each and every one. We ask you, Lord, that you'll look upon the burden of each heart, Father. Lord, that you'll talk with each one. God, you'll teach us your way more perfectly, Father. Lord, we ask of you that you'll bless the choir tonight. Father, you'll bless the special singers, Lord. May your divine hand move upon each one of these requests that's been read forth here this evening. Visit each home, Father, each room, God, where people can't be here. Lord, we pray that you'll take care of them, Father, and help them. And then, God... There's no doubt many ones, Lord, that have burdens on their hearts behind these upraised hands, God, that was not audibly spoke, Father. But, oh, God, you see each one, and we ask you, Lord, that you'll move upon each one of those heavy burdens, Father, that your name be glorified in our midst, dear Lord. God bless Brother Worley this evening as he stands before us, Lord, to declare your word. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you'll anoint him with your anointing, God. That, Father, he may be able to word those things, God, that, that are so needed, Father, in the souls of each one of us, God, we pray. Father, this evening we ask you to bless each and every home, God, that's represented here. Lord, you know each one has burdens, Father, and they have lost loved ones, Father. And God, give us wisdom to be able to bring in, Lord, souls throughout this coming week, Father, that, Lord, they may be introduced to Jesus Christ and his salvation, Lord. We pray, O oh God, you'll see us through. Guide us and direct us, Father, in everything we do, Lord, that it may be all to your glory and your honor. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.
darkness around me, sorrow surrounds me, and though there be trials, still I can sing, for I have this treasure, my God reigns within me, and I am determined to live for the King. I am determined, I will be faithful, till he has finished his purpose in me, and nothing shall shake. this determination God help us to pursue that amen, amen. Yes. number 390 we'll take our evening offering please let me see Jesus only <laughs> Jesus 
sing it all the way through. Yeah. We didn't have enough money to make it last for four verses. We got enough God to make it last. Storms in fury lead around me take this sisters Andy Stevenson with us tonight she has a special God bless her she comes been several years. I think the last time I was here probably was with maybe with Grandma and Grandpa Pryor. And I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, I don't, I'm not very good with names, so don't ask me to say your name. <laughs> not that I, not that I don't think that you're special, but I'm just not good with names. I've always been bad at that. My husband's really good at that, so Anyway, um, I just felt like God, you know, had laid it on my heart to share. Um, he had given me the words to this song several years ago. And so I'm just going to share it with you all and pray that it blesses you in Amen. some way. I 
can always count on you. Standing firm on the word of God that holds so true. And you perfect everything that concerns me. Only you have the power to perform a miracle so that your glory shines through me. I've stood here and claimed my healing in this life you gave to me. I learned how to trust and give you all my life. And you will keep me in your great favor and for all of my days I will live for only. me healed each day when I awake and I could never repay the mercy he gave freely to me with his blood on Calvary cover for all who can believe I've stood here and claimed my healing in this life you gave to me. I learned how to trust and give you all my life. And you will keep me in your great favor. And for all of my days, I will live for all. And I'll hold your word in my heart for all my days, never turning back and never look away. For you are my hope, you're my strength, and you are all I need. Thank you for your endless healing touch. I've stood here and claimed my healing in this life you gave to me. Learned how to trust and give you all my life. And you will keep me in your great favor. And for all of my days, I will live. You will keep me in your great favor, and for all of my days, I will live for only you. Yes, I will live for only you. have a trio for the message. Since Christ my soul from sin set free this world has been a heaven to me and mid her sorrows and its woes tis 
step, my Jesus, here to know. Once heaven seemed a far off place, till Jesus showed his smiling face. Now it's begun within my soul. Twill last while endless ages roll. Oh, hallelujah, yes, is heaven. Tis heaven to
can be thankful for every time the Lord has stepped in and been there in our lives. I'm very thankful for that tonight. Amen. God is so faithful. Hallelujah. Always faithful. Not sometimes faithful, but always faithful. Aren't you thankful for that this evening? I'm very thankful for the Word of God and thankful for Brother Worley. I was thinking that even today, uh, you know, we're getting into a time where the Word of God is not popular, right? But it's not about popularity, is it? It's not about that at all, but I'm thankful for the men and women of God that will take a stand for the truth of God's Word. So I'm thankful for Brother Worley tonight. We look forward to what he is uh, going to preach this evening. So we ask you uh, to listen. I, you know, let me, let me just say this real quick. You know, we can, we can come into the house of God, but uh, what, what we receive is, is really up to us. Amen. The man of God can get up and be prepared and take all the time unless, unless we receive it and take it in. Amen. It's totally up to us. So I pray tonight and I want to take just a moment before Brother Worley steps into the pulpit and have a word of prayer. Uh, but we want to just lift him up and we want to be prepared to receive the word of God as God has laid it out tonight. Let us have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you tonight, Father, for your presence, Lord, here in our midst. Well, God, we recognize how great our need is tonight, Father, and well, God, how great the need not only in our lives are, but Father, in the lives of those that we're in contact with. Well, God, we just want you to know we appreciate you tonight. We appreciate, Father, your word. Father, we appreciate your son, and we appreciate your Holy Spirit. God, we pray tonight for Brother Worley, Lord God, so thankful, Father, for him, Lord God, for his ministry, Lord God, and Father, for his faithfulness, Lord, to, uh, to minister the gospel. Lord, I pray tonight that you would use him in a special way, Lord God, anoint his heart, his mind, his, his very lips, Lord God, and the words that are being said tonight, Lord God, help us to receive them, uh, Lord, not just for uh, this evening, Lord God, or something temporary, but Lord God, that it would make eternal uh, benefits in our lives, Lord. Father, we love you tonight, and we appreciate you. Lord God, may your will be done in here tonight, and Father, we'll give you the praise for all that's done. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Brother Worley. Thank you, appreciate buddy. You, bless your heart. I'm so glad to be here with you again tonight, thanking God for this day that he's given us and for the kindnesses bestowed on me. It was a wonderful uh, lunch this afternoon. The cooks did a great job, and... Uh, just give of their time sacrificially, uh, and we so much appreciate it. Uh, appreciate the accommodations that have been afforded me, the motel over in Heath, your support, your prayers. Can't say enough about that. I am not 100% coming to you this week. Um, it is an age thing, evidently. I'm feeling things, experiencing things, going through things that are kind of foreign to me that they tell me is just the way of things. So get used to it and go with it. And so, uh, but I'm, I'm blessed and God has, it, it isn't hindering me in any way uh, to speak of. And so I'm thankful for that. Uh, and I appreciate and covet your prayers. If you would, take your Bibles with me now to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings, I want to speak about something there this evening that God has laid on my heart since I got here. Not born out of anything, not uh, because of anything, uh, nothing other than my own mind went to work 
And I suppose that there might have been a phrase or something that just piqued me in my spirituality and in my mind. And one thing led to another, and here we are. And so I'm going to do the very best that I can. And I say that I can't do anything. The best I can falls far short of what God must do through me tonight, I pray. Now, when we look at 1 Kings chapter 19, we're familiar with this story about Elijah. He's coming off of this uh, tremendous victory of having called the prophets of Baal to task for their foreign gods and allowed them to call upon their gods and do what they would. And in their, their failed attempt, he, he embarrassed them by laying a sacrifice on the altar, drenching it in water and praying down fire and it was consumed. And then he had all the prophets of Baal killed. And so God, it was evident to every onlooker uh, that God was in this guy's life. And so the, we close out uh, chapter number 46 with, with that, uh, or chapter 18, with that having transpired. And we open in chapter 19 with Jezebel heard what Elijah had done. She throws a fit uh, because Ahab told her, and he sent word, she sent word to Elijah, you're a dead man. <laughs> in essence, that's basically what the message was. And so you would think that this guy says, Hey, sticks and stones may break my bones, but you ain't going to do a thing to me, honey. And just stood his ground. But he run. <laughs> he run. This has been, when I've studied this over the years, it's been one of the most amazing things to me in, in all biblical accounts of a man of this grandeur and stature and the power that was on him. He would run when Jezebel threatened him. Well, having said that then, he finds himself under a juniper tree in the fourth verse, and uh, he sits down there and he's wishing to die, and a number of things transpires, and the word of the Lord comes to him and get, tells him some things. And so, in verse number nine, he finds himself in a cave, and this is where we want to pick up the reading. First Kings chapter 19, verse number nine. And by the way, those via the internet tonight, we are thankful that you're tuned in watching. We hope this will be benefit to you too. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, well, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of the host uh, uh, of the Lord God of hosts for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek to take it away. <laughs> self-absorbed, I'm the only guy left, and then full of self-pity. They want to take away my life. Guy's in quite a, quite, a, quite a condition here. And he said, go forth then, stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. Now here's Elijah fearing for his life, doing just the opposite of what God had, had uh, ordained him and called him and used him to do. And the Lord's going to show him something. And the Lord passed by in verse number 11, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake either. My words, not the Bible. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. That still, small voice that can thunder in the ears of a man or woman and make it readily apparent that God is near. Father, we only want to pray your blessing on this and help us 
and use this for a few minutes to encourage and strengthen your people and quite possibly see someone that would come to you. In your name I pray, amen. Of all of the things that can occur to an individual, there's nothing more endearing in my mind because of what was born out of it than to hear the voice of God. Now there are a lot of people that will step up and they'll say, God told me. Or I heard from God. And it's evidently not true by what occurs after that. But we know very well by our own individual experience, don't we? That there is a voice unlike any other. It is more precious and more dear in the heart of an individual than any other. When Debbie says to me, she tells me often that she loves me. But there are those times when she gazes into my eyes and looks in my face and said, Mike, I love you. It's a special moment. It's an endearing moment. And there's nothing like to me, as a husband, when my wife says, I love you. Now, sometimes she'll say that thinking she's going to get what she wants. <laughs> she uses it as a triggering mechanism to try and melt me into submission. But there are those times when she has no ulterior motive and she's speaking from her heart. When I was a young father, when Angel, my daughter, or Chad, my son, as a little toddler out of nowhere, they would run up to me and say, Daddy, I love you. Oh, my heart was theirs. Men and women have been moved by the voice of their leaders. We have been stirred and called and moved to action. Presidents give speeches and speak to the nation to comfort us and to assure us in times of trouble and mourning. We hear voices all the time that are trying to get our attention, that need our attention, Voices of affirmation, voices of encouragement, and again, those voices that tell us how much they love us. But of all the voices that one can hear, all the manifestations of an individual that can communicate to an individual with what we liken to a voice, there is nothing, nothing like the voice of God. And I'm convinced the reason we don't have greater revival, the church is not stirred to action, many are never fully submitted to the cause and the call of God on their life, is because they choose to ignore the voice of God. Whenever Moses uh, observed that there was a bush that was on fire, he was compelled to look at it. But when he heard the voice, he was moved to respond because of it. Paul on the road to Damascus and all that defined his wicked life, he heard a voice that drove him to his knees. And when he heard that voice again, it brought him to his feet, and he preached like no other in human history. The voice of God, when it is listened, when we hear it, 
when we respond to it as we should, it will change not only our life, but the lives of those around us. When an individual responds to the call of God, I remember very well my unsaved years before Christ. The voice of God, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like the voice of God. And I remember when it thundered in my ears when I stood at altar call, doing everything I could to ignore it, wanting to run from it, out of respect for my family and the minister, remain where I was, wishing they would be quiet, shut up, and quit praying, and let me out of here. Because the voice of God was calling me, come unto me, might come to me. In the stillness of the night, I could hear that still, small voice. And that defining moment in time, when it came for me to make a decision, it wasn't God taking advantage of that and threatening me, coercing me. It wasn't doing anything but calling. Softly and tenderly, we sing, Jesus is calling. And I believe that hell is full of people that have heard that voice and chose to ignore it. Lives today are problematic. We would say it's inexplicable the things that people are involved in and do that bring about their own demise, either physically or in relationships, in any number of ways. I can explain it. They've chose to ignore the still small voice. It's amazing how we can listen to every other voice out there. Giving us advice, selling us products, wanting us to vote for them, trying to sell us the latest item. In all kinds of ways, and we give credence to that, we listen to that, we believe that, we respond to that, and that's who we are. It's quite normal. But for some reason, and I know the reason, and they sometimes are unique to the individual, but there are reasons for it. When God, a sovereign, eternal God, takes time out of all that's going on, out of all of the wars, out of all of the killing, all of the maiming, all of the molesting, all that humanity heaps on humanity, all the things that demonic forces have brought to bear and is being visited on us tonight as a species, and where we are, in our cultures around the world, and the effects of sin that's taking its toll. All because we have chose to ignore the still small voice. I have preached my heart out over periods of time to my congregations and wondered can you not hear his voice? I have wondered at times when people come and go in the same condition. Did you not hear the voice? When I have tried to deal with other individuals and sort out chaos in their lives, I have wondered, is not God speaking to you on that? That still small voice that Elijah heard would position him for two things. 
First, it would be revealed to him that there were 7,000 that had not compromised themselves and then position him where the transition would begin for the mantle to be placed on Elisha. The reason God speaks to you and I is to position us in days to come where he wants us to be, we need to be, and if where we're need, we need to be with God, we must be. God's not in a lot of things that go on in our lives, in our homes, in our communities, and dare I say, in the church house. Ignoring the voice of God. And I'm convinced that because God is no respecter of persons, that God is defined by his love for every one of us, that long before the results of our bad choices or our decision-making process or our carnality unfolds and manifests itself in ways that are un not Christ-like or even ungodly, there is a voice that God tries to, to penetrate in our mind, in our psyche, in our spirit, in our heart, like only God can. I know the devil talks to people. <laughs> I know the devil talks to people and talks people into things and talks people out of things, i.e. altar calls and repentance and doing the right thing. But the voice of God is unique. It is unique in that it is defined by that compassion. No one, I've never, in over 40 years of ministry, never counseled anyone and said, God's speaking to me and he's threatening me. <laughs> God's talking to me and I'm convinced God does not love me. Oh no. It has brought them to tears. It has brought them to their knees. It has brought them into recognition that God loves them enough to speak and whisper to them, come unto me. I believe that the fix for our lives, the fix for what ails us as a nation, as a culture, as a community, and if need be in the church house, is to have, to, to glean a greater appreciation, a greater sensitivity, a tenderness, and a desire to hear the still small voice. We are busy, we are distracted, our lives are full, but we need to get alone with God. We're told constantly to pray and talk to the Lord and, and those kinds of things. But I'm telling you, and this is as good for me as anyone else, I, you, we need to get alone with God because where we are in all things, we need to find out what God wants us to do, what we need to do so that we can do everything possible as individuals as community, as church, and as saints to try and fix some of what's wrong. It's not marching. It's not debating. It's not threatening. It's not trying to get our agenda to float to the surface as supremo. No, what it is is trying to figure out with God's voice and God's direction, spirit-filled people can hear the voice of God and be directed and get their marching orders so as to know what to do collectively as well as individually on how we can bring about revival. Now I say that not quite tongue-in-cheek, but so that we don't misunderstand, especially if there's someone that doesn't really know me and is watching this via the internet, I know that we can't bring about revival of our own volition. But we play an integral role as to whether or not we will have revival. And often it's listening to the voice of God and God's voice saying, get off of that lounge chair and get to church tonight, they're having revival. <laughs> you know, it might be that easy, that simplistic. 
but I don't want to oversimplify. I think that what the church needs to do, again, we pray for guidance, we pray for protection, we pray for blessing, we pray for a lot of things, and all of that I cannot fault tonight, nor would I dare. I don't want to trivialize or minimize those prayers. But how easy, I wonder, or how difficult is it for us to hear God's voice? Over the years, I have marveled at those who said, God told me, and when it is revealed what God told them, I am astounded at the beauty and beholding what God can do with someone when they hear God's voice. You and I know very well it was the voice of God that brought us this. It was the voice of God that stirred our predecessors to flee the Church of England and come and establish this very nation. Our history is replete, our individual personal lives. All of us have a story and a testimony about what God has done when people listened and God was in it. But for some reason, we don't hold that as valuable as we once did. We are people that we have resources at our hand. It has been made easy for us. We have everything at our disposal. And I continue to marvel at, 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 this, at this thing called the Internet. And I looked at your screen this morning, and whoever has your website up and running uh, is doing, in my mind, and I am not a techie, I've still got a phone that flips up. <laughs> I don't have a phone that's smarter than me. And so I, I was somewhere recently, and I took my phone out and opened it up, and the girl was just taken aback. I don't think she'd ever seen one. <laughs> Young lady at the counter, she said, "What? Wow! I don't. That is. I don't know that I've ever seen one of those." <laughs> I said, "Honey, I said, man, that is me. I take a call. I make a call. I don't need anything else." But I saw that screen, and from one side to the other. There was Twitter and Flitter and flown and gone and come and stay. I mean, all kinds of stuff. And a couple, and I didn't know, I said, a couple of them I never even heard of. So you're a techie web guys, quite a guy or girl. And I'm, I'm glad for that to some degree. But, but don't you see, it's easier, rather than try to find out what God would say, we Google. Come on. If we don't have the answers, and, and I understand it, that's a good thing. I've had, to, I've had to have my wife, she's got a smartphone. She laughs at me all the time. I said, oh, Deb, I ain't never going to. But I said, Deb, check this out for me. Or I call my, I've got an, uh, 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 my brother's wife, a sister-in-law, and she's real good. Uh, my son-in-law, real, real keen on all that. And so I get them, and they're probably one day going to say, get your own phone. Get your own stuff. We, we, ain't your, we ain't your secretary. So I try to minimize that from happening. But it's all too easy to go to the Internet. It's all too easy to go to other sources that are made available. And to hear all of that. Now, I'm not suggesting we need to hear the small, still small voice on how to bake a chocolate cake. I mean, you know, I, I, if God comes to you and tells you how to bake a chocolate cake, I want to hear that story. I want to hear what that's got to do with everything. And so in its place, that's fine. But we've become so accustomed to not having to listen for God because the answers come from everywhere else, then it's hard for us when God tries to speak, it's hard for us to hear that still small voice. Now, why, the question that begs asking is, why wasn't it a large 
roaring voice. You ever thought about that? Because when we can hear the still small voice, then we're in a position where that nothing else can affect us and drown out that voice. I'm convinced this is where God wants us to be. In order to hear the still small voice, we need to check our lives and get rid of anything and everything that is roaring in our ears, roaring in our mind, roaring in our spirit that would prohibit us from hearing that still small voice. For you see, Elijah would have never heard the voice as long as he was caught up and distracted by what Jezebel was wanting to do and that threat ringing in his ears. But when he finally came to a place where he could hear that voice, it was calming, it was reassuring, and it was leading, and it took him, and it placed him, it positioned him for the next level and plateau of his ministry as it began to wind down. I think this tonight, and we have some of them here, some young people. I marvel at how quick young people are learning all things technical and all things that are their world in the 21st century. And I'm, I'm not only being left behind, they can't even find me anymore. <laughs> I'm just so way back. And my, my worry is, is they'll become too familiar, too comfortable, and too satisfied with every other voice but the still small voice. And I suppose every generation that could be said, but none more than the 21st century. But God's voice is still relevant. It's still relevant. The ages have quieted and stilled the voices of our leaders, the arts, the philosophers, the inventors. Every voice eventually will be stilled. And often as things begin to come and go and through generational change, voices begin to be irrelevant. Not necessarily true, but they are seen, seen to be irrelevant. And I think that has never been more apparent, and I want to be careful here, but, but I, I, I know what I'm talking about, that has never been more apparent than in the divisiveness that has been brought about in the war that is taking place between traditional worship and contemporary worship. And early on, the critical mistake that the contemporaries made was alienating the church that laid the groundwork for them to even exist in the first place. And they were seen as irrelevant they were given permission to be there, and they were thrown a bone. They were spoke to in condescending terms, but no longer appreciated for what they had brought to the table, continued to bring to the table, and the resources that they had were no longer valued, and they were becoming irrelevant. Some of that has been rectified, but there's still a chasm, i.e., traditional worship, 830, contemporaries at eleven. Used to be vice versa, but now, now it's shifted. So I, I don't want to get into all of that and be seen as some kind of a troublemaker, but, but I, I've got a very formidable opinion on how the devil has tried to use this to bring about war. And all of it is born out of the fact that all too often, all too many, 
were unwilling because they were too stubborn, too proud, and had to push their agenda, and they could not, they would not, and wanted nothing to do with the still, small voice. And in my life, and in your life, and in the church life, and in the community's life, in our nation's life, and in the world as a whole, you choose to ignore the still, small voice. You do it to your own peril. Nothing good can come from it. And all of us, at some level, at some time or another, have a testimony to that very thing. How often we've said, if I'd, if I'd have just listened to God. We didn't mean to ignore him. We didn't, we didn't necessarily rebel against him. But we knew this had a bad odor about it. <laughs> and probably because God was telling us, that's a septic tank. That's not a swimming pool. We marched off anyway. And woke up not feeling so good and smelling even worse, spiritually speaking. And so, like Elijah, with all that's going on, and all that is bombarding, and all that is, that is, that is uh, doing everything it can to grab our attention, and all the decisions we must make, and all of the things that are our responsibilities, and yes, I know we are a busy people, we're a fast-paced people. And I know that there's no getting around that for the most part. But we need to get and have that Elijah experience where we can find a place where we can hear the voice of God. We, we know we can't do this on our own. We know that we don't have the intelligence or the wherewithal. We don't have... There's not an individual that has ever breathed the breath of life, recognized they'd sinned and come short of the glory of God, then realizing they needed a Savior, got right with God, began to walk by faith and not by sight, grew in grace. Not one single human being who has walked that path has ever got so close to God, they didn't need to hear His voice. From the point of conversion to our last breath, we must hear. In fact, I'm convinced that it's as important to hear the voice of God as it is to have our heart continue to beat. Because obviously your heart doesn't beat your dead. I ain't telling you nothing you don't know, but to illustrate to not hear that still small voice is eventual death. It is eventual death. And Elijah was his own worst enemy until God stepped in and demonstrated this very thing to him. In other words, I'm not in the wind, I'm not in the fire, I'm not in an earthquake, and I'm sure not behind Jezebel. So forget all of the noise, get your mind off of all the distractions, and get behind your fear. Remember where I've brought you from, what I've brought you through, and the abilities I have, and sit still for just a moment and listen to me. Maybe you find yourself tonight in a place but that you need to listen to God. There is a decision to be made. There's a problem you're experiencing. There's a sickness. This sister back here shared her testimony with pancreatic cancer before service. I'm sure her, like so many, on more than one occasion, has had to shut her mind and her attention off everything else, and listen for God. Some of my best experiences in my own experiences has been when I've heard God. Do all of you know what I'm talking about? No, you do. When inexplicably, but undeniably, 
God whispered in your ear. I know when God called me to preach. I know when God tells me, no, that's not a good idea. I've tried to know when God tells me, you need to apologize for that. I've heard God say, step out, go ahead. All kinds of times. Now, I'm not trying to convince you that I'm ultra sensitive, super spiritual. God may talk to you, but God talks to me all the time. Reminds me of a story. A man came to church one day, he was all excited, and he walked up to the preacher and he said, Hey, preacher, said, I talk, God talked to me this morning. The preacher kind of took it for what it probably was and said, Well, that's good, brother. I'm grateful. God's good. He does. He can talk to us. And so the next week, here comes the guy again, and he's just really excited again. He said, he said, preacher, God, talk to me this morning. God was talking to me. Now, the preacher's thinking, man, I got I to gotta get a handle on this, and so here's what I'm going to do. So he said, brother, well, that's a wonderful thing. But he said, if God really talks to you, I, I need to put this to the test. Can you trust me on that? He said, sure. He said, well, there's something in my life before I got saved that I did that nobody knows about. I've never whispered it. I've never confessed it to anybody but God. And if God talks to you, you ask him what that is. And if God's talking to you, you'll tell me what that is. Next week he comes back. Here he comes. He's smiling. Preachers, he, his heart's already sinking because he's going to tell him that he talked to God. God talked to him. So the preacher, before the guy can say anything, said, did, did God talk to you? Yes, he did. Did you ask him about the sin that I've never confessed nobody knows about? He said, I did. Well, what did God tell you since he talks to you? God told me he doesn't know what he, you're talking about because he's forgotten it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad for that. But God does talk to us. Recently, it brings to mind, recently, our vice president was taken to task because he talks to God. And God talks back. Now you think about that. You think about that. A man being mocked by, by leftists or liberals or whatever label, by, by anybody, by many people who may not even have a political bent to them, that would hear that in our society nowadays, that somebody talks to God while, and, and of course we're always, well, pray, okay, so talk to God. But God does not talk back. We talk to God, but God has little to say to us. Oh, my friend, God has a whole lot to say to us. And if we would listen to the voice of God, a whole lot would be better because of it. In closing, the rub lies in the fact we probably, and I say we collectively, I don't mean that as a blanket statement, but to a great degree, we don't want to hear what God has to say. We're afraid of what God might say. There are people that are afraid to ask God and listen to the response on God, what would you have me to do? They're afraid God's going to say, go to, go, to the, go to Africa, you know, or go to the Philippines or somewhere. Go to some third world country and, and, and be a missionary. Like the rich and rural, sell everything you have. Take up your cross and follow me. What happened to that guy when he heard those words? He went away sorrowful. And a lot of people are afraid to ask, and then when they hear they're sorrowful because they don't feel they have the capacity to fulfill that mandate. Well, all righty then. If you're afraid of what God will say, then don't ask. Don't listen. But I can assure you that you're going to give an account. 
not only for the sin of commission, but the sin of omission. And too often, too many people omit doing what God would have them to do because either they've chose to ignore the voice of God or have not positioned themselves in a place where they could hear it in the first place. Now, this isn't for everybody. Now, a sinner, well, it is on, on some level because a sinner can hear God's voice. To this end, when they need to be saved, they're going to hear God calling and speaking to them. It's going to be thundering in their ears. We call it conviction. A voice that roars like thunder, and yet it is inaudible. But they can hear it. We've experienced that. But beyond that, beyond that, God doesn't really communicate to sinners. I mean... God may do, allow things to happen, position them, and rain falls on the just and the unjust, and all kinds of things happen. But really, when push comes to shove, God, this, this is a privilege that is unique to the children of God. And so in God, and by the way, we not only need to hear God in closing, giving us our marching orders, as it were, or laying out his mandate for the progression of the church and the gain of the lost and, and, and the survival of the church for the future, as your good pastor alluded to this morning. But in times of sorrow and in times of trouble, When I have heard the voice of God tell me, fear not. I still love you. I will bring this to pass. This too shall pass. To whatever end I've needed to hear that voice, God has spoke volumes in one simple phrase. I have been fortunate to hear a number of wonderful orators in my lifetime for different reasons on different occasions. But I have always marveled at how Jesus could speak a few words and move the masses. <laughs> I know what you're thinking right now. I wish you were as gifted as that and would preach for five minutes and move up. <laughs> okay. All right. But there's no one that can speak as softly and tenderly, as convincingly and as far-reaching as the voice of God, if we'll listen. Now, ultimately, ultimately whether we want to or not, whether we choose to or not, whether we ignore it or not, one day we will stand and God will speak to us one last time. That is, if we're lost. Can you imagine, can you imagine a million years from now, having been there for a million in a place where God doesn't even talk. That voice that we've taken for granted, that we've heard, sometimes we ignored, many rebel against, many have chose to turn a deaf ear of all a lifetime and to find ourselves. What would an individual right now in hell? I have an uncle. I'll, I'll close with this illustration. I had an uncle. Where conviction in a camp meeting, it wasn't by chance or mere circumstance, but by divine providence, he was brought to this camp meeting in Burnside, Pennsylvania, back in 1974. 
My car, Debbie and I, have been married a little over a year. Our daughter had been born. She was just a few months old, tiny little old thing. And our car blew up on the way to camp meeting. And they felt so sorry for us because we were newlyweds practically and a new baby and just an old car that broke down. So they, they took up some money and they give it to us and we were going to tow it back. So we got a hold of my uncle back in Lansing, Michigan, and he brought his van and we got a, a, a U-Haul hitch to hook up to that car. And that took a little time and so he was at the camp meeting. God blew up my engine to get my uncle to camp meeting. <laughs> now, God didn't just blow up my, but God allowed my car to do that, and here he come. And this will be important by the end of this story. And I'll never forget it. I was just, like I say, young guy in my very early 20-somethings. And so I didn't, wasn't a part of what was going on, but I was an, a young Christian observer. And it was glaringly apparent that he was under great, great conviction. He, was list, he could hear the voice of God. Weeping profusely, people at the altar who knew of him, my, my mother being one of them, his brother, a couple other individuals at the altar, praying that God would just continue to deal graciously and mercifully with him and that he would submit. He fought that long enough that the ministry felt that God had done all that he could and they had done everything they should, and so the meeting was that night was closed, and the next day he left with my car in tow. That was in July of 74. Fast forward to May of 1975, Memorial Day. My uncle decided with his wife and his daughter to go to northern Michigan to one of the lakes for a little bit of R&R &R for the weekend, long weekend from work and all of that. And on his way up there, he came within half a block of my grandmother's, his mom's home, and he went in as he always did to tell her he loved her and to tell her goodbye. The last thing she ever said to him was, I love you, and you know I'm still praying for you. Oh, Mom, yeah, I know that. He said that it was later told, and he blew it off got in the van with his family, went to northern Michigan, pulled on to the site, got out of the vehicle, and dropped to the ground, grasping his chest. He cursed and told his wife, I think I'm having a heart attack. He said this. No, no, get it right, Mike. His little girl, familiar with church, crying, scared to death at what's going on. Her daddy's laying out there. Something horrifically wrong. She looks up at her mother and says, Mama, pray for daddy. The woman said, I can't. I can't. The last words he ever heard his daughter say, Mama, pray for Daddy. The last words he ever heard his wife say, I can't. And he knew what that meant. She wasn't in a condition to pray. And he died. Gone. In a moment of time. What's your point, preacher? That still, small voice. He chose to ignore it. And less than a year later, he would go to meet God, bring it full circle back to where I started. What would he give now to hear that voice again? What would he give to hear the voice he heard at that camp meeting, thundering across eternity, come to me. You need me. 
Give your heart and your life to me. So gently, the Holy Spirit is the perfect gentleman. And it thundered in his ears. And he fought it long enough that God was not going to violate his will and let him go to hell in spite of himself. Friend, now, I may be talking to a sinner tonight that God's going to be speaking to in a minute. You need to come. But for every one of us, there's a lot hanging in the balance when God speaks. One, we need to listen. But first of all, we need to be in a position so that we can hear what God needs to tell us. Because God can keep us out of trouble. God can get us out of trouble. God can do a lot of things. What is that phrase? Oh, yeah, Jesus is the answer. Well, he is. Well, there's no answer if you can't hear it. If you can't hear the answer, if you're not in a position to hear the answer, if you can't hear the voice, it does no good for him to have it. You'll never figure out what that is. So while Brother Sherm comes and our piano player, good piano player, and we get ready if that's what they're choosing to do tonight for altar call, maybe you hear that voice right now. And you need to respond in kind because you know why God's speaking to you. God's been dealing with you. God's been trying to reveal to you. God's been trying to talk to you and move you into a position of a greater nearness. Maybe there's a call on your life. Maybe you've backed up and God's trying to restore that which is lost. I don't know what God has to say and what God's trying to say, and maybe some of it, if not all of it, you're hearing, but how will you respond to that voice tonight? Of all the voices I've ever heard, I will be most grateful. If all the world fell dumb and could not speak a word, I would be sad for that, all that would be lost because of that. If I could never hear Debbie say to me, Mike, I love you, honey. If my precious granddaughter never say, I love you, Papa. If my little great grandson, I've nicknamed him Bubby. And so he thinks my name is Bubby. If I could never hear that voice again, I'd break my heart. This young couple that's going to have a baby in just a little while. It's voice, first thing's going to say, <laughs> and how precious a sound that's going to be to you, not at 3 a.m. in the morning, but when they deliver it to you. And without all of them, how much would be lost in our lives that brings so much because of our voice and the human capacity to speak and communicate. But if all that was gone, I would only need to hear one voice to my dying breath. And that would be that still, small voice that could whisper whatever I needed, whatever God wanted. And ideally, I would respond in kind to what the voice was saying to me. Would you stand with me now for just a moment? Father, I pray that with that still, small voice, you'd speak to our hearts tonight to any and every individual that needs to have something communicated that would reveal that need anew, that might reassure them, that might compel them to move and motivate them to action. I pray, Heavenly Father, deal with us graciously first by speaking. Visit us by whispering that which we need to hear in our ear. Your will be done, we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother? Number 143, 143. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you. Watch 
reaching for you and for me. I'm home. Come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. One last thought, Brother Bartlett can conclude the service as he feels led to do. If my wife hadn't talked to me in months and would not talk to me or could not talk, for whatever reason, communication was severed, I'd be worried. If my kids quit communicating with me, I'd wonder what was wrong. If everybody around me had nothing to say to me and chose to say nothing, I'd begin to take note and self-reflection and wonder what's going on here. What's happened? Because I can hear a bird chirping. I can hear a siren blowing. I can, I can hear, it's not that, but I can't hear a voice. Do you know where I'm going with this? The question is, how long has it been since God spoke to you and you heard what he had to say? I can't say how often God needs or would or would desire to talk with you, but I can tell you, I can assure you that God must communicate with us quite often. For direction, for guidance, for answers, to reveal to us, to make correction, to bring about a sense of obligation or surrender. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that God needs to talk to us. But we've, we, we, it's too easy to become accustomed to not hear God because we have everything else and we're just quite satisfied with all of that. I'd worry if God hadn't dealt with me. Hey, and I can tell you, when I was, uh, when I was lost, if God didn't bring about conviction and I couldn't feel God speaking to me for maybe two weeks, I began to wonder, has God give up on me entirely? As a sinner, I used to worry when God would talk to me. You think about that. I'm just so sorry. As long as God talked to me, I'd just take my chances and push that envelope. But when he quit talking for a couple of weeks, I thought, oh no, oh no. If I send away my grace. But then he'd come again, and I'd be in conviction, and then I'd be then I'd be thinking, will you people be quiet and let me go? Oh, it was a vicious cycle. I was so sorry and so lost. That one Sunday, when God came, like he did so many times before, and convinced me my only help and my only hope lay at that altar at the front of the church because I was about ready to leave the door. And the preacher said, don't you think, don't you want to pray? Okay, I said. <laughs> and there I was, and the rest is history. Don't take God's voice for granted, church. Sinner, if he's speaking tonight, listen carefully to what he has to say. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you? Should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Come home, come.
कम हो up to me when I came up on the pulpit, <clears throat> Brother Wilson was talking to an individual, and her complaint was, she or he, I'm not sure, but that individual's complaint was, Brother Wilson, I can't hear God. And he said to that person, it may be the reason you can't hear God is because your ears are dirty. The truth of the matter is, Brother Worley already touched on it, not everybody really has the courage to want to hear from God. But what an honor what a privilege it is to have God speak to our hearts. God leaves none of us in the dark. The Holy Spirit of God is faithful. And as Brother Sherm sings one more verse, why don't you whisper a prayer tonight. And hopefully we all mean it from our heart. God, I really want to hear from you. I've got this idea about things. I've got this notion. Like Brother Worley said, there are a lot of voices in this world. There's a lot of noise. And the world's good at filling our heads with noise. Because the prince of this world knows that God doesn't speak through all the commotion. So why don't you and I, all of us, Just ask God. God, speak to my heart tonight. This has been a beautiful message. It's a revival message. And God will be faithful to speak to you. So listen carefully and ask the question. And if you feel God is conveying something to you, I don't know what it would be, but you'd be highly honored to hear from God tonight. We've already heard from God through his word. So God bless you as we sing one more verse. It's been a good audience, and I know people are tired. It's been a long day.
Jesus is calling, calling, oh, children, come home. Thank you for your attentiveness tonight. Next service will be tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock. Brother Worley will be preaching. So whatever the Lord talks to you, whatever he asks you to do, make a phone call, contact somebody, invite a stranger. Keep your ears attuned and ask God to speak to your heart in some way concerning this revival as you go your way. And you're all dismissed in the name of the Lord.